Friends, this last part of our workshop was a presentation by Dan Pratt at the Astarte Farm here in Hadley, Massachusetts. Dan does a lot of creative things at the Astarte Farm, and uh, including high tunnels and uh, creative plantings. I think whether you're a gardener or a grower, you'll find Dan's presentation very interesting, very educational. Take a look. Okay, last but not least, uh, we have Dan Pratt, the manager of Astarte Farm here in Hadley. And he's going to speak about what you can do with NRCS funding, all sorts of things. Having visited recently, I was so intrigued to see irrigation, windbreaks, high tunnels, pollinator habitat, and so. Right, and I have to tell you, folks, I brought my no-till presentation, so I may be distracted from the uh, from the government funding that we were able to see. And really. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience to work with USDA and their Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS. For us, uh, they have been welcoming. They came out and did an initial conservation plan on the farm, and then it was just a matter of staying in good touch, watching a little bit of the news to see what funding has been sprung in various different farm bills. Um, Currently out on the farm, I think we have two unheated greenhouses, which we call a high tunnel. And these are fairly substantial. The widest is 26 feet wide by, I can't even remember, 160 feet long. Uh, we have one smaller one that's 17 feet wide. And those were almost 100% funded by a grant from the NRCS. And one of the really great things about a high tunnel, not only are you uh, eliminating a lot of the vagaries of the climate because you're controlling everything that happens underneath that sheet of plastic, but you're also greatly reducing any kind of water runoff. So in terms of water quality, I mean, we use drip irrigation, uh, and there's really very little that's escaping from that system. So we had, we had great, great luck with, with that funding. It's actually a little bit of a neat situation where I sold the farm, and the guy that bought the farm then was a new farmer. So that was how we were able to get two high tunnels out of the deal. Uh, but while I owned it, uh, we also had substantial assistance putting in a buried, I think it's a, two-inch irrigation line that now feeds our entire three-and-a-half-acre operation with drip irrigation. And drip irrigation is a really nice way to keep water in the ground where it belongs and eliminate a lot of runoff. Dan, I don't see a PowerPoint presentation. It's just slides. It's just slides. Okay. If you get it up, I'll, I'll start babbling about that. So the irrigation system was another wonderful thing. And then I think the next program, and I like, I like to refer to all of these programs as the alphabet soup from NRCS because there's just a whole lot of initials and it's really good if you can get a connection with someone in the office and find out which one of those alphabets applies to you. But one of the nice ones that we've been working with recently has been for pollinator habitat. And I like to really emphasize that pollinator habitat is only half the story. It's predator habitat as well. So the same flowers that are helping our bumblebees to survive, helping the honeybees to get some good pollen, it's feeding all of these small wasps and parasitizing numerous garden pests. And we've had really great luck with our cucumbers, since we started all of this pollinator habitat, we used to have a lot of trouble with cucumber beetles. We didn't grow any cucumbers except in high tunnels because we could keep most of the beetles out. And I think that we're almost to the place now where we're, <laughs> we're going to try and grow some outdoors again. And it's the same thing with peppers. We had to grow only peppers in a high tunnel because we had so many pepper maggots, we would lose sometimes 80%, 90% of a crop, beautiful red pepper with a big fat worm on side, you know. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been really interesting because they actually helped us plant 
all of our buffer zones. We're certified organic, so we have to have a buffer zone around our field. And they helped us plant uh, flowering shrubs. And we were lucky enough to just show up at the Hadley Garden Center at Home Depot and Lowe's, end of the season, and we bought a lot of flowering shrubs. We now have something that's flowering almost year round around our field. And we sort of sprinkled things around so that if a predator pollinator is happy over here and they sniff something, they have to fly all the way across the field and get some more over there. We've done annual plantings. Uh, the, last, uh, the last major thing we did was almost a quarter acre of flowering shrubs. And this was not uh, a total grant, but they've given us a, a substantial amount of money for the plant material and also for the maintenance. We tend to use a lot of sheet cardboard and wood chip mulches. Because we're certified organic, we can't use any of those cardboards that have colored inks, but we found a source with only black ink, which is apparently carbon. And that has been uh, a major improvement for our farm because instead of dealing with a weed whacker on all of our paths, we've got these lovely cardboard and then a layer of wood chip paths. And we're even able to run a tractor over those and not sink into the hubs. It's been a slow process, but uh, it's really, really helped us out quite a bit. And I would like to put in a big plug for earthworms and water retention. Because one of the things when we first bought this farm, we used to have three seasonal ponds. And they were basically just where a, a disc had been run over that field, spring and fall, spring and fall, spring and fall, and smeared any little clay particles into an impermeable layer. It's kind of like what you call a plow pan, but I call it a disc pan. And we just uh, left those sections of ground alone. We basically have done as little tillage as we can, particularly in the last four years. Uh, we got to no-till in sort of a strange way because we bought a little uh, Italian spading machine which was supposed to be much easier on soil structure. It's like a slow motion rototill. It has little shovels that dig into the ground and throw the dirt straight back. And then we had grass paths, which we mowed, grass or weed paths. And within about five or six years, those weed paths had raised four to six inches above the production beds. And we've been cover cropping, applying compost, treating them as well as we possibly could. But even though they would fluff up taller than the path, after a couple of rains, they would just sink, sink, sink down. And the pictures that uh, Masood was showing of the cracking of the soil surface was all over those beds. And it just was a, a sort of a click because when you would dig, like when we put the irrigation system in, you dig across one of these grass paths and it's, it's just riddled with holes. And you dig across one of our production beds and it was a pancake. It was solid. So we've just completely converted the farm in the last four years to 100% no-till. And we've used the spading machine as a wheel weight when we're running the snow plow. <laughs> but we don't use it on the soil anymore at all. How many acres do you have in production? It's three and a half acres in production. It's about a six and a half acre total property. But there's house, farm, mm -hmm. these high tunnels. Um, and uh, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was mushrooms. I saw you had a picture of mushrooms growing alongside one of your plantings. And really, if we can end up with more fungal activity in our soils, not just the bacteria, but the fungi, 
I think that's where really a lot of the carbon sequestration is occurring. And there is an incredible economy that happens between these fungal roots and plant roots, passing on sugars and proteins. And uh, it reminds me of the forest in your forest garden. I love the thought of these trees and those living roots. We've done a little bit of experimentation with perennial cover crops. Uh, the one we've had the most success with in the high tunnels is a low-growing sedum. And that has made a lovely weed-free bed. And it's, it, it freely replants itself. So if you separate the plant and rip some out, it doesn't seem to mind very much. We're able to transplant right into there. That particular bed is, is actually noticeably higher than all the other beds in that high tunnel. And it's just a matter of that living room going on all the time and the, the good action happening in the soil. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry my pretty pictures didn't come up, but... Yeah, it says um, the files may be damaged, corrupted, or too large. Sorry. Oh, sorry. It's, my, it's my big, big file. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a beautiful place. So I don't know if I've covered enough on NRCS. Did anybody have any questions on that? If that was what I was billed to talk about. And my, I would encourage anyone with a farm to snag them and get a relationship. Uh, what, what particular crops do you grow no-till at this point? Uh, well, we grow garlic, heirloom tomatoes, lots of lettuce. Um, we've got the cucumbers. We're doing a lot with cover crop cocktails, so we're actually harvesting some of our daikon radish out of that mix. Um, eggplant. I, I, I would have to look at my crop list. It's a, it's a highly diversified farm, which is also beneficial, and we're able to keep our six-year rotation, which is, which is good for organic certification as well. Questions or comments, Jim? I was just going to add, uh, I work for the Conservation District and speaking with the Farm Bill and upcoming program, we are having a workshop on May 7th at the NRCS office and they will be talking about a little bit about some of the changes in the 2018 Farm Bill. What time? It's from 4 to 6. And it's an open meeting and we'll have snacks. It's free, and I have had some work from NRCS on my own small farm, and having a relationship with folks over there is always beneficial. So I encourage people to think about attending. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, for coming. I just want to thank, again, the Friends of Lake Warner for providing this space and all the snacks. Um, and it really was great to see an overview of the issues that the watershed is having, a lot of <clears throat> the good things that are being done, either on the large scale, as Masal showed, on the smaller homeowner scale, as Jono um, demonstrated, and then with a couple of our local um, organic farms. It's, it's inspiring, knowing that there are issues with the watershed, but also a lot being done um, to help restore it. Um, we had wished for a larger crowd, but we're happy for those who came. If you could, could all please sign in and complete uh, an evaluation form. And if I have the permission of the speakers, I will gladly share also your presentations, including Dan's. We could share it perhaps on the Google Doc sure. so we could all view. Um, and I just want to say, um, yes. if, if I... You want to see some books that I brought here as resources, and I also have a book that I published called Permaculture Promise. It's kind of a simple intro guide to some of the things I was talking about. And so they're for sale here. Yes, there's materials here. We encourage folks to join the Friends of Lake Warner, become a member, support the good work that they're doing here. And if you have any questions, uh, you can contact me through the Conservation District email. And um, really delighted for your interest and your participation tonight. Thank you so much.
Yes. I just want to comment. You know, it's, it's a big part of the economy around here. But if you ever wanted to have some really good hard cider, it's <laughs> under the Cars label, C A R R. And I try that. Let's let's all give it a try and support Jonathan. Yes. <laughs> On behalf of the Hamlin Conservation, Hamlin Hampshire Conservation District, thank you all for coming. If we could be of any help, just give a Jen a call or, or go on the on way. Thank you. Yes, this brochure is here also for the Conservation District.